come on and stand with me this morning. We may be just a few in number today because of the rain, but the Lord's here, amen? And that's all that matters. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 56 and verse 7, Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. I want us right now just to go into that time of prayer together as we start this service this morning. Can you just take somebody by the hand next to you and agree with them this morning in prayer? Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in this house of prayer. It's not just a house of worship. It's not just a house of praise. It's not just a house of the preaching of the Word of God. It's not just a house of fellowship where God's people come together and encourage one another, but it's a house of prayer. And we're praying today that you would move in this service, God. We bind everything that would come against your movement in this place. We come against it in the name of Jesus Christ today. Father, I pray that nobody would leave this house this morning the same way that they came, but that they would leave controlled by the Spirit of God, consumed by the Spirit of God, touched by the Spirit of God. Come on and just let your, your presence fill the atmosphere in this place today, Lord, and do the things that only you are able to do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, remain standing this morning. Let's worship with our praise team today.
this morning. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We know that when we speak your name, the things begin to happen this morning. And we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Oh, we love you, Lord. I pray for your healing. The circumstances would change. I pray that the fear and stop would be Jesus. Jesus. 
Can it? 
told you this time and time again church in this kind of atmosphere anything is possible it doesn't matter what you came into this house with laden with burdened with weighted with heavy with in this kind of atmosphere in the presence of God anything is possible come on if you're able to right now stand with me all over the house right now if you will today I want you just to lift your hands to heaven as a sign of surrender to the Lord to say, God, what, do what you want to do in my life today. I'm yours, Lord. You see where I am? You see what I'm facing? You see what I'm struggling with? You see what I'm going through? You know things about me, God, that nobody else knows about me. But I know something about you too, Lord. And that's that you're there and that you care today. And Lord, you are able to take it away, whatever the it is in my life. Whatever I walked into this house with, weighted down with, you're able to lift that burden this morning. Come on, ask Him to do it, church. Today could be your day of deliverance. Today could be your day of being set free from what you've been struggling with for so long. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, today is the day of salvation. Come on, let's just worship Him. Let's praise Him. Let's cast our cares upon the Lord right now. Come on, Sister Kim, sing it again.
Come on, take somebody by the hand next to you to agree with them in prayer. If two agree as touching anything, it shall be done for them. You might look at your prayer for healing list in your bulletin this morning. Continue to lift up your pastor's wife today. Brother Charles Bethune at home fighting cancer. Brother Al Gentry at home fighting cancer. How many of you know that doesn't scare God today? Amen. Sister Charlie Faye told me that they're improving but still in need of complete healing. Unable to be with us in service this morning. Come on, let's lift these up to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we pray for those that are a part of our church family today that are not able to be here with us for various physical reasons. God, I pray right now that you would touch them and strengthen them in their bodies. Father, I pray for my wife today that you would bring miracles into her life. I thank you for how far you've brought her, God. But I'm praying today that you would finish the work that you have started. Lord, I pray for my mother-in-law and father-in-law unable to be with us today from fighting sickness this past week, asking you to lay your hand on them and to bring healing into their home. God, I pray for Al Gentry and Charles Bethune this morning that you would deliver their bodies of the cancer that they're fighting today and minister to them with the word of God, encouraging them and strengthening them with your presence at home this morning. Father, I pray for our church secretary and children's church leader that's unable to be with us today because of physical complications, that you would touch Jenny at home this morning, Lord, and strengthen her and deliver her from the pain that she's in today in her neck and in her back. Father, I pray for her mother today, Lord, who was in the hospital last night from blacking out, that you would touch her and minister to her body today and bring healing, and I thank you for it, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence this morning, God. Come on, church, can we just take a minute to say thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you, Lord, that when we have a need, you are there to hear our prayers. And you're there to answer our every need. God, you're a good God. You're a right on time, God. And we love you this morning. We praise you today, Jesus. Be high and lifted up and magnified and glorified in this house this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, you can be seated this morning. Let's worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings today.
Come on, give the Lord another hand of praise this morning. I forgot, as I usually do, to make mention that, first of all, if you're a guest with us, Pensacola First Assembly, you can be seated this morning. We welcome you to the house, and I, as I usually do, uh, forgot to mention, put that guest card, visitor card in the offering bag as it comes around. But you can fill that out if you'd like to this morning. Let us know how we can pray for you, how we can minister to you today at Pensacola First Assembly of God. You can turn that in to an usher, me, anybody you want to at the end of service if you'd like to do that today. Next Sunday, let me remind you, is BGMC Sunday again. We brought in over $3,900 for boys and girls, missionaries for Christ around the world last year. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise right there. We've set a goal for $5,000 this year. So you help our children. Uh, not having children's church this morning because Sister Jenny is out uh, very sick today. Please be in prayer for her. But you help our children next Sunday to bring in money for missionaries around the world. Brother Mike, Sister Jerry, on the last Sunday of each month, doing a wonderful job. Uh, missionary, uh, excuse me, BGMC Sunday in Kids Church, where they take our children to somewhere different around the globe and teach them about the need for Jesus in that country and fix them a, uh, a dish or a dessert specific to that country that they get to enjoy. Just having a wonderful time together. No, you're not allowed to leave me and go back there next Sunday. But... I do thank God for our children. Let me also make mention briefly, and we'll be bringing more to you about this in the coming weeks, uh, but uh, coming soon, Sidewalk Prophets, March the 4th here, using our facility at Pensacola First Assembly of God. Uh, tickets will not be on sale through our church. You must access tickets or buy tickets through SidewalkProphets.com. We're simply hosting, uh, uh, providing a venue for them. All ticket sales, let me reiterate, must go through uh, the Contemporary Christian Band uh, Sidewalk Prophets. So be in prayer about that. I believe it will be a wonderful time of ministry to our community, ministry to the church. Looking forward to that concert here at PFA. Also, we finished last year uh, concerning the... Uh, pressure washing and the painting of all of the 12th Avenue side of our building and most of the Bayou Boulevard side as well. And we would just invite you, we need about another 5,000, is that right, Sister Jane, to finish the Bayou Boulevard basically from the main entrance over this direction. Need about another $5,000 to have that done. If you would like to give to that, every penny of what you give to the building fund is designated to be used for the building fund. So we invite you to do that. And you can really see a difference now between that side and the front. The front is nice and white and clean. And this side over here, not so much. So we invite you to participate in that. You know, you may not be able to write a check for $1,000. Maybe you can only write a check for $10. But it's when we all come together for the good of the glory of God and the kingdom of God. Amen? Let me also... Amen? Amen. Let me also invite you back to prayer this Monday night at 6 o'clock from 6 to 6.30. I want to thank those of you that have been faithful in coming. And Wednesday morning, the sanctuary open for prayer as well from 9 to 9.30. Lastly, let me make mention to you that today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, a national day set aside to uh, pray for the unborn, to pray against abortion in our nation. Thank God for what God did in 2022 in reversing Roe v. Wade. Amen. And how many of you are familiar with Dr. Bill Lyle at all? Heard him on national radio or television programs. He's going to be with us the first Sunday of June, on June the 4th, uh, speaking as we uh, always do. Uh, during Mother's Day to Father's Day, we have a fundraiser, uh, the Baby Bottle Fundraiser for Safe Harbor Pregnancy Resource Center here in Pensacola. And I've invited Dr. Bill Lyle, who is nationally known for 
uh, the work that he's doing in the fight against abortion as a gynecologist, a practicing gynecologist, have invited him to come be with us that Sunday, June the 4th. So mark your calendar. It's going to be a special time. He's going to be teaching, preaching, uh, and talking to us concerning the new developments in the fight against abortion. But he's not just about uh, coming against abortion. He's also about ministering to people that have had an abortion. How many of you know there are a lot of people that have had an abortion that wish they'd have never had an abortion? How many of you know that God forgives and God heals? Amen. God mends. God restores. And we want to minister to them today uh, as well. We're going to be inviting the Teen Challenge ladies to be with us that Sunday. I hope they'll be able to come be with us. And I pray it'll be a day of not only spiritual warfare, but also a day of ministry as well. I found out when I talked to Dr. William Lyle, I knew that he was from Pensacola. But I found out in talking to him on the phone that his office is actually right across the street here uh, from our church. So he's excited about coming and being with us on that first Sunday of June. I want you to look with me in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 13. And I need a couple of men. Tyler, if you and Thorne would come help me real quick this morning, please. If you would gently and very carefully just... Stand on each side and remove this uh, tablecloth this morning for me. Second, Second Kings, I might have said Second Corinthians. Second Kings chapter number 13, if you will. If you'll begin looking there. I want to enter into the third. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to enter into the third message in our Sunday morning series of Make Prayer Your Priority, Part 3. This is part of a sermon series that I started at the beginning of the year uh, concerning Make God Your Priority. And I'm preaching right now on how is it that we are able to make God our priority. And I've started with this wonderful, beautiful gift that God has given us called prayer. So I'm preaching the third message, Make Prayer Your Priority. And I've subtitled this message, Empty Your Quiver. Empty your quiver, and you'll understand that more as we read this passage of Scripture together and get into the preaching of the Word of God this morning. In the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria and reigned seventeen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, which made Israel to sin, he departed not therefrom. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel, all their days. And Jehoahaz besought the Lord, and the Lord hearkened unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. And the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, but walked therein, and there remained the grove also in Samaria. Neither did he leave of the people of Jehoahaz, but fifty horsemen and ten chariots, ten thousand footmen, for the king of Syria had destroyed them and had made them like the dust by threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, and Joash his son reigned in his stead. In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel in Samaria, and reigned 16 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, who made Israel sin, but he walked therein. The rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did and his might, wherewith he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat upon his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. 
And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land of the coming in of the year came to pass as they were burying a man that behold they spied a man of men they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha he revived and stood up on his feet but Ahaziel king of Syria oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz and the Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. So Hazel, king of Syria, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his stead. And Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father by war. Listen. This is important. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the city of Israel. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your presence that's in this house. I thank you for the people of this church that are here today. I thank you, God, it's been a month since Christmas Eve that you began to drop this word in my spirit, and it has been stirring and churning there for nearly a month. And I am praying today that I would be able to deliver my soul of the Word of God that has been put in me, that I've not been able to get out of me for the last four weeks, but I pray that with the anointing that the Holy Spirit has spoken it to my heart, so would there be the anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach it today. I ask, as I always do, that there would be an open heaven above us this morning, God that the people of this church would not hear the thoughts and the opinions and the commentaries of of a man on the Word of God, but that they would hear a message from the throne of God. And I pray that you would remove every distraction that is within us today, in our bodies and in our minds, and every distraction that is around us. I pray, God, that you would help people to stay settled and not to be getting up and moving around, something I don't often pray. But today would be a day, Lord, where people would remain settled so that they can hear what the Spirit of God would speak to their hearts today. For I know that this is a word that you have given me to preach for the individual that is in this house this morning, but also collectively for the people of Pensacola First Assembly of God. I know, Lord, that prayer is the flywheel that makes the engine of the, of the church move forward. And now, Lord, we've been praying in this place. We've been seeking you, God. We've made this not just a house of worship and not just a house of praise and not just a house of the Word of God, but we've made this a house of prayer. And I thank you, Lord, for how you're moving because your people are praying. Not everyone's able to come out on Monday nights and Wednesday mornings to pray, but, Lord, there are many more at home that are praying. There are some that are telling me, Pastor, I'm getting up every morning at 4.30 and I'm praying for you and I'm praying for your family and I'm praying for our church and I'm praying for God to move. Others, Lord, are spending time in prayer, diligently seeking you to save the lost in this place. Lord, we're praying for revival, but revival never begins in the church. Revival always begins in the individual heart and then moves to the home, which then moves to the church and ventures out into the community, changing communities and regions and nations for the glory of God. And so I pray today, Lord, that revival would begin in our hearts, that there would be a conviction of sin, that there would be a convincing of the word of God, that there would be a compelling to this thing that you have given us to talk to you through that we call prayer. And I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would have his way with your word today and that your word would be true and that that it would not return to your void, but that it would accomplish that which is pleasing to you today. I pray that there would be illumination today, that there would be revelation today, that there would be an understanding of the Word of God today. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I've created a uh, visual illustration for you on the communion table this morning. I've brought my crossbow and laid it there. Uh, Brother Mike Simmons has brought his quiver full of arrows for you to see this morning. Brother Jimmy Simmons has brought his compound bow uh, with a quiver full of arrows as well. And I, what I'm trying to do is help the individual that is visually stimulated. Some learn through visual. Some learn through hearing like I do. Some learn more through reading. And so I'm trying to incorporate all the various types of learning processes, the reading of the Word of God, the hearing of the preaching of the Word of God, having something visually stimulating in front of you so that maybe somebody might leave this house this morning and not so easily forget this Word. Oh, how it grieves the preacher of the gospel to know that 90% statistics say 90% of what he or she preaches on Sunday mornings is forgotten about on Mondays. We're living in a fast-paced world. We're living in an all-consuming world. There's so much data, so much information that's hitting us constantly and continually. But let us focus for the next few moments solely upon what the Word of God would say to us today. Let me provide for you a brief history in an introduction to this message this morning so that you might better understand what's taking place in 2 Kings chapter 13. At this time, the nation of Israel has been divided through civil war for several generations. Israel and, and Judah are divided in what is called the north region and the south region. Judah, which is at the south, consisted of two tribes of the nation of Israel, those tribes being Judah and Benjamin and Israel consisted of the other 10 tribes to the north. It was because of Israel's idolatry that they had been living in at this time that they are experiencing a continual oppression from the nation of Syria and the kings thereof. Understand that because of uh, the, the sin that uh, Jeroboam had brought into the land of Israel, he instituted idolatry when he separated the ten tribes to the north away from the two tribes in the south. He instituted idolatry by making golden calves for the people of God to worship. He built places of worship away from the temple in Jerusalem where they were supposed to worship together. He made priests apart from the Levitical priesthood and appointed priests that were never supposed to be priests. And he made feasts and would make sacrifices to these golden calves for fear that the ten tribes in the north would try to venture back to the south to Jerusalem, which was the capital of Judah, and try to join themselves again there to Rehoboam, the king of the nation of Judah at that time. And so because of their idolatry and their great sin, God has allowed Syria to oppress them for many years. We read here in 2 Kings of various, ki various names of kings that were not living for God and therefore they were experiencing great oppression. But the one that I want to zero in on with you this morning is the king simply by the name of Joash. And we know that in the latter part of 2 Kings chapter 13 that this man hears the news that the man of God, Elisha, is going to die very soon. Now, he is not a man that has been living for God. He's a man that's allowed continual idolatry to remain in the nation of Israel, but he had respect for the man of God. And he, therefore, he had respect to some extent for the word of God and the one true living God. And so he makes his way to visit the man of God laying on his deathbed. Understand that to the east, as the Bible tells us, from where Elisha's home is, there are the lands that are occupied by the Syrian armies at this time. And the man of God tells the king, I want you to take a bow and I want you to take a quiver full of arrows and I want you to point the bow out towards the window towards the east. Now this 
this was something that was commonplace in that day. It was something that was normal and a ritual, if you will, that if a king was going to make war against another nation, he would shoot an arrow in the direction of wherever that enemy was that he was going to invade. But the Syrian army is not just in their own country, on their own turf. They're in the nation of Israel. And so the Elisha tells the king, I want you to point the arrow towards uh, where the Syrian armies have occupied the nation of Israel this time and I want you to pull back the bow and I want you to shoot the arrow signifying that you're going to make war with them but the most important part of this that I want you to understand this morning is not just that the king would pull back the bow and not just that the king would shoot the arrow in the direction of the Syrian army but the Bible says that when he pulled back the bow Elisha took his hands and laid his hands on the king's army. What he was saying was any victory that you're going to have is not going to be a victory that you bring on yourself. It's going to be a victory that God brings for you. And king, you better listen this day. You need to go back to worshiping the one true God and get rid of the idolatry in the nation of Israel. And so in putting his hands on the king's hands, he was saying what the prophet said in the Old Testament. It's not by might nor by power, but by by my spirit, saith the Lord. I just want to remind you this morning, church, what you already know, and that is if this church is going to accomplish anything at all for the glory of God, it's going to be because the Spirit of God is making it happen. If we're going to see anybody get saved and born again into the kingdom of God, it's not going to be because a preacher preaches on a platform. It's not going to be because we got great praise and worship, which we do, but it's going to be because the Spirit of God is in this house, and there's a st- and there's a convicting power of the Holy Ghost. My heart grieves this morning that we don't see these things happen more regularly than what we do. But I believe and am encouraged also at the same time that if we will make this a house of prayer and if we will be a people of prayer, we will see God do the miraculous. The Word of God says that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we are able to ask or think. How is that done? According to the power that works inside of us. That is the power of the Spirit of the living God that's inside of His church today. And if His church will be His church, and if His church will believe God of what His Word says, we will see the impossible. Do you believe it this morning? I believe it today. I believe it today. Without God, we can't do anything. Elisha was telling this king, without God, you cannot do anything. You cannot conquer the Syrian army. You cannot gain control of the nation of Israel again. But with God, all things are possible. But the man of God does not just stop at telling the king to shoot one arrow towards the the armies of Syria. He says, now, the the King James says, I want you to smite more on the ground. What that means is I want you to pull more arrows out of your quiver, and I want you to shoot more arrows into the ground out that same window in the direction of the Syrian army. Now, you got to understand and remember this morning that this is a king that's not been living for God. This is a king that's not been faithful to God. And so he doesn't have faithfulness in his life that produces faith. If you want more faith in your life for God to move in your life, you just stay faithful to God. Because I can tell you from experience that the more faithful you are to God, the easier it is to have faith in God. How many of you know I'm preaching right this morning? You don't have to struggle to have faith. You don't have to struggle to believe God for miracle signs and wonders. You just walk with God and you're going to see miracles, signs and wonders. You just walk with God and you're going to see God part the Red Sea in your life. You just walk with God. Just be consistent day in and day out. How many of you know that consistency is the key to success for anything in life? If you want to build a career, if you want to grow a business, if whatever it is that you might be trying to do, if you're trying to raise children, whatever, it's just day in and day out. Some days you feel like it and some days you don't. How many of you know that's right? Some days you feel like getting in the Word and other days you just don't feel like getting in the Word. Some days, oh, I'm preaching now. Some days you feel like going and praying and other days you don't feel like going and praying at all. Some days you feel like getting up and going to the house of God come Sunday morning and other days you just don't 
don't want to go, but you know what you do? You get up, and if you're able to, you go anyways. You know what you do when you don't feel like getting in the Word? You get in the Word anyways. You know what you do when you don't feel like you can break through in prayer? You pray anyways. Because if you're consistent, you're going to see success. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. If you're faithful, you're going to be filled with faith. Faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not something you can produce in your own life. It's not something you can produce in yourself, but it is something that the Holy Spirit can produce in you. And I don't care what you're going through this morning. You can have enough faith to find your way on the other side of it. If you'll just walk with God, he'll put the faith inside of you to believe for the impossible. But this king wasn't walking with God. He wasn't being faithful. So don't you know he wasn't full of faith? And so the man of God said, I don't want you to just shoot one arrow in the direction of the Syrian army. I want you now to go ahead and I want you to start pulling out more arrows out of your quiver. And I want you to start shooting more into the ground. And the Bible says that the king, as an act of lack of faith, just pulled two or three out. Just pulled three out, actually, the word of God says. And shot three into the ground. And the man of God was upset with him. He was mad with him. He said, because you only shot three into the ground, you're just going to see a minor victory in your life. You're going to smite the seer three times you're going to bring back their cities but you're still going to be somewhat over their oppression because you don't have enough faith to believe that God can completely rid the nation of Israel of the Syrian armies altogether because you're not a man of faithfulness you're not a man that's full of faith and the man of God was upset with the king because he just took three arrows out of his quiver and just shot three into the ground. And the man of God said, you should have shot five. You should have shot six. I'm telling you, it was Christmas Eve and we were sitting there. My wife had just ended up in an ambulance and going to the hospital on December the 23rd from passing out of the house, dealing with heart problems and neurological problems and all sorts of other problems and trying to figure out what's going on. And it was Christmas Eve that we were sitting in our home and praying and the Holy Spirit drop this word inside of my spirit don't just pray two or three times don't just pray a little bit but go ahead and shoot every arrow out of that quiver that you got called prayer believe God for the miraculous believe God for the impossible believe that God to show up and show out and we began we began, I began pacing the floor and my wife began sitting there on the couch praying and we'd get done with one prayer meeting, we'd take a break, we'd come back go into another one. We'd get done with that one, we'd go back, go into another one. We'd get done with that one and go into another one. Sometimes we're too stuck on the television, too stuck on our iPhone, too stuck on Facebook, too stuck on Twitter, to find out what everybody else has got to say, not stuck enough in the Word of God, not stuck enough in prayer to believe God, but we just shoot one arrow out the window window and pray one little simple prayer God move in my life God change my life God help me but the Lord saying hey I want to know just how much faith do you have in me how many arrows you going to pull out of that quiver are you going to keep praying are you going to keep believing are you going to keep trusting me when no reason causes you to do it Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment, test after test. Nothing changes. I just want to give God glory right now. She may not be in the house of God with me this morning. She's sitting back there listening to this message right now on the telephone, though, on speaker right now. I just want to give God glory because he's already brought her a long ways. And you know what? The quiver ain't empty yet. So we're just going to keep pulling out the arrows and keep shooting them into the ground and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying, and keep praying, and keep, oh, praise God, I'm believing in for the miraculous today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I'm a bow hunter. And, 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 and Brother Jimmy, I don't know where Brother Jimmy is. He's on security detail somewhere. I used to hunt with one of these. I used to hunt with one of these compound bows. But then about four years ago, my wife bought me that crossbow. <laughs> Brother White, I sold the compound bow. I don't know what you hunt with when you bow hunt, but I love my crossbow now. I've taken enough deer with that thing, I don't want to go back to the compound bow. But one thing you cannot have enough of is arrows. Because when you get out, when you're going to shoot, sometimes if you're a bow hunter, you like you got it, especially with a comp... Oh, I'm going to preach right here. Sometimes with a compound bow... A lot of y'all don't know anything. I'm going to teach you a crash course on a compound bow right here. See, these compound bows, they're not like the old-fashioned re recurve bows like Brother Mike's got. 
No, you, it, it, you, you, you got to pull it all the way back. Mine used to be set at 58 pounds because that's all you really need for deer hunting. But a lot of guys like to, you know, they like to go out and be macho man and they'll put it at 70 pounds. If you're elk hunting, you want to go on up, crank it up to 90 pounds if you can. And you got to pull that weight all the way back with your arms. And a compound bow lets off about 80% of that. Mine was a 70% bow. It, it took off 70% of the 58 eight pounds because you've got to sit there and wait for the perfect shot for that deer. So you don't want to be sitting there holding 58 pounds the whole time. So it takes off a certain percentage. But if you're a compound bow hunter, you can't just pick up your bow in October. No, no, no. You need to be out there in summertime pulling it back and shooting it because you got that i've seen a lot of guys no offense thorn i love you i've seen a lot of guys work out at the gym they can't pull a bow back because it's muscles you don't use it's muscles you don't typically use for lifting weights and stuff there's a whole set of muscles that are required for pulling back oh god help me this morning there's a whole set of muscles used for pulling back that bow that you don't need for anything else see prayer ain't like everything else no, no, no. And you got to stay in practice or you, if you get out of practice, you're not going to be as strong in prayer. But I just want to encourage you this morning that whether you feel like it or not, you go ahead and pray and spend time in the prayer closet. And whether you see God moving or not, you go ahead and believe God anyways because you got to stay in practice. you got to keep those spiritual muscles where you can put because when the enemy gets in your sight, and you're able to lay it down and lay the law down right there. You gotta already be prepared. You gotta already be ready because there's gonna come a day of victory. And you don't know when the day of victory is gonna come. See, I don't know when that eight point buck's gonna step out in front of my tree stand, but I gotta be ready for him. I gotta be prepared for him. I gotta be anticipating him. I gotta have already been practicing. I gotta, and you can't have enough arrows because you're gonna lose some. Yeah, you're going to lose some. Some of them, they, they made a uh, carbide. Some are made of aluminum, but they're going to break. Sometimes if you're really good, if you're really good, you can be like Robin Hood, and you can split the backside of one arrow with another one. Now, I'm not that good, but I can rub them right next to each other. And so you're going to break some. You're going to break the shaft on So you can't have enough arrows. See, the man of God was telling the king, listen, you can't pray enough. You can't believe God enough. You just keep pulling till the quiver's empty. I just want to encourage you today. You can't seek God enough. You can't believe God enough. You can't pray enough. The victory's going to come one day if you'll stay consistent in prayer. Stay faithful. Whew, I hope I'm helping somebody. I think I'm helping myself a little bit this morning. See, it requires, it, it requires practice. It requires faithfulness. It requires calling those things which are not as though they already were. It requires, ooh, listen to me, it requires an anger with your enemy. See, the king wasn't angry enough that the Syrians were invading Israel and occupying his home country enough. Because when you get angry enough with your enemy, you're going to shoot every arrow out of that quiver in anger. You listening to me this morning? Sometimes we, get, we just play in patsy with the devil. Let me tell you something. The devil ain't playing patsy with you. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He's out to annihilate. He's out to consume you. You better get real in your spiritual warfare, brother, sister, because the devil's already real about it. It requires an anger with your enemy. It requires a fed up, sick and tired of what it is that he's doing. It requires coming to the place where I'm sick and tired of watching you lay hands on my family. I'm sick and tired of you taking my kids out of the house of God. I'm sick and tired of watching you bring, uh, try to come in and steal my peace and my joy. I'm sick and tired of you, devil, and I'm so angry I'm just going to keep floating, shooting arrows today, one out of the other till the quiver's empty. But you know what I found about the spiritual quiver? The Holy Ghost just keeps putting arrows back in it. So you just keep praying. I'm in spiritual warfare mode right now, Brother Lucky. I know I'm, I'm, I'm look like a little nut up here preaching, but I'm fighting for my family sitting at home right now while I'm preaching the word of God. I'm sick and tired of what the devil's doing, so I'm just going to keep shooting, keep praying, keep believing God. <coughs> Requires <coughs> an understanding of spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power.
power of his might. Are you listening to the words he's using? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore. Amen? It requires an understanding that I'm engaged in conflict. And he's out for keeps, and I better be out for keeps too. If you want your children to make it home to heaven, you better pray for them. Oh, pastor, my, guy, my, my son's a pastor. My daughter's married to a pastor. My kids are in ministry. My grandsons are on the mission field. You better not stop praying for them even more so. Even more so. You better keep pulling some arrows out of that quiver called prayer. Amen. Y'all with me this morning? The king didn't have enough faith to see full victory, and he never saw full victory over the armies of Syria. Oh, we say we want revival, church. We say we want to see God move and God show up, and God show out, and God do things. But you know, the church is content with a little shiver up and down the spine in the altar service. Oh, you better keep pulling some prayer arrows out of that quiver. Oh, Brother Clendenin used to say whenever he'd get the school of Christ into another country, whenever he would, he would make it into another country, communist country or whatever it was, and they'd been praying and praying and praying that God would open the door for the school of Christ to go into whatever that country where the door was closed, and he'd get word from somebody that worked for him one day and say, Brother Clendenin, we made it into that country, and his response would be, we better start praying now. And they'd say, no, Pastor, you didn't understand what I said. I said, we already made it in. He said, I know exactly what you said. And it's time to part pulling some more arrows out of that quiver and start praying like we've never prayed before. We don't stop just because we get a little shiver up and down the spine. We don't stop just because God does a little something, just because God does a little move in my life. You keep praying until you got the full victory, brother. You keep praying until you see them come in, in the droves, being found at the altar of Jesus Christ at the cross. We keep praying for revival till we see it and we don't be content along the way are you with me this morning oh my goodness let me hurry this morning Luke chapter number 18 verses 1 through 8 Jesus spoke a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God neither regarded man and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because of this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. In other words, just because you pray the first time doesn't mean the answer's on the way. Yeah, forgive me, forgive me. Some fool came up with that mess back in the 80s and said if you pray the second time, it's because you didn't pray the first time in faith. I'm here to tell you if you don't pray the second time, you ain't got no faith. You better pray the second time and the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time and the sixth time and the seventh time. You better keep pulling arrows out of that quiver and shooting them into the ground if you want the full victory. God teaches us to pray with faith, but real faith doesn't give up on God just because the answer hadn't come yet. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect which crieth day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, whoo, this is powerful, church. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Jesus is coming back to this earth. Jesus is coming to establish his rule and his reign and his kingdom on this earth. The rapture of the church is real and an inevitability, and no lack of faith in it is going to stop it. The rapture of the church is going to take place, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye of the last trump, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them to be with the Lord in the clouds forever. I believe that this morning. I believe the word of the Lord. The rapture is coming. The second coming of Christ is coming. The millennial reign of Christ is coming. Eternity is coming. But Jesus said, when I do come back to the earth, am I going to find a church full of faith that's still pulling arrows out of their quiver and believe in God for the impossible? 
Matthew chapter 7. Come on, praise team. Come help me this morning. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Oh, let me, let me just re-preach here this morning. Let me re-teach here this morning, church, because repetition is the art of learning. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven good give, good, give good things to them that ask Him? How many of you know God loves you this morning? How many, of you go, how many of you know God wants to answer your prayer today? If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth the Word of God says. How many of you know He's hearing you today? Oh, listen to me, though. We become frustrated. We become, we, we become despondent, we become despair, we become depressed, we become anxious, we become all these different things. Because I prayed yesterday, but I'm the same, oh God help me this morning. I prayed yesterday, but I'm, I'm in the same condition today I was in yesterday, so prayer must not have worked. You better keep pulling them arrows out of that quiver. You hear me? You better keep pulling them arrows out of that quiver. You better carry the quiver with you. Don't just let prayer be what you do at church on Sunday. You better carry the quiver with you. See, this is designed to go where I go. This is designed to go where I go. Hold up that shield of faith against every fiery dart of the wicked one because he's going to be shooting arrows at you, isn't he, Tyler? You better shoot some arrows back, brother. You better shoot some arrows back. You better carry the quiver with you. Are y'all listening to me this morning? I believe that God wants to do the miraculous. I believe God wants to do the impossible. But he's not going to do it if we just shoot two or three arrows in the ground. But if we'll keep praying. Say, Pastor, you told us we were going to see miracle signs and wonders. And we're having these prayer meetings. And we're not seeing everything. Just, hey, listen, I ain't giving up. <laughs> I'm not dismayed. Pull it back again, brother. Let it go. Pray again. Pray again. Well, your wife's at home and not at church. Pray again. Well, that heart's still doing that funny thing. Pray again. Well, they don't know what's going on with the neuro. Pray again. Well, they can't figure out. You better pray again. Carry the quiver with you. Come on and stand with me all over the house. Today's the day of salvation. If anybody's here today, I've been praying for you. If you're lost and not found, and you need, you need Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You need the Lord to forgive you of all your trespasses and all your sins. And you need to stop living for your own glory and start living for the glory of God. I've been praying for you. I've been shooting some arrows in the ground for you. I've been shooting some arrows out the window for you. Today's the day of salvation. Come on right now, every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for just a moment. Is there anybody here that today that would say, Pastor, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life today. I know I'm not ready to go to heaven. If I die in a car accident on the way home today, I know I'm not going to heaven. Today is the day of salvation. Is there anybody that would say, Pastor, pray for me today. Let me see your hand right now. I'll pray for you today. I'll shoot an arrow for you today. ask them to sing this song again this morning somebody saw a hand I didn't see thank you salvation is real easy the Bible says if anyone would confess with his mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart that he rose from the dead he shall be saved If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Come on, if you're here today or watching online and need to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, why don't you just pray this simple prayer with me right now? There's no formula to salvation. 
no, no formula, no sinner's prayer that we read about in the Bible, but some people don't know what to say. Some people don't know what to pray. I'm going to help you right now. Lord Jesus, come on and pray with me. Lord Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner and I need your salvation. I've been running from you, but today I'm running to you. Lord, I surrender my life to you today. Forgive me for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe you took my punishment on the cross. And I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe you're coming back again for them that are living for you. Jesus, save me today. Jesus, be the master of my life today. Jesus, be the Lord of my life today. I turn from my sins. I repent of my sins. I turn to you today, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. If you pray the prayer like that, come see me after church. I want to talk to you and give you something this morning to help you as a new disciple of Christ. I haven't even known salvation is not about a prayer you pray. It's about a life you live. I've asked them, though, to sing this song this morning. Your cry has awoken the master. They sang it a couple weeks ago. It really ministered in this house. But as they pray, this is your altar invitation this morning, church. As they begin to play and sing this song, I would ask you, is there something troubling you this morning? Is there something you've been praying for and asking God to do in your life, but you've not, you've not seen Him do it again? Why don't you come into this altar today and shoot another arrow out the window? Why don't you get angry enough with the devil for what he's doing in your life? Why don't you fight back in prayer? Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God, help us today. You know what Jesus is looking for in you and I? A spirit of tenacity. A ten like a bulldog. I ain't giving up. I ain't letting go. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep trusting God. So as they pray that, as they play that and sing that song, I just want to invite you, church, to this altar. You know what I think? I think everybody's got something they need to pray about again. That's what I think this morning. I think everybody's got something they need to pray. How many of you have a lost loved one you've been praying for, but you've not seen them come to Christ? Shoot another arrow. How many of you need God to move in your life financially? Shoot another arrow. How many of you need God to move in your family? Shoot another arrow. Come on, Sister Kim, lead us in that song this morning. The altars are open, church. Because you prayed all night, but you held on with all of your might. Shout your cries, and woke the master.
You know, as I was praying for people in the altars, I found myself praying, God, that when I can't go on, anybody ever been there? When I don't have enough faith to pray anymore. Because, God, I've been asking you to move, but nothing's happening. And, Lord, my quiver's empty. And I found myself praying for people in the altars. When I find my own quiver empty, let me reach back and find the Holy Ghost put another arrow there. An arrow of faith. (laughs) An arrow of belief. An arrow of strength. An arrow of trust. An arrow of surrender. To come back and pray one more time. How many of you know sometimes you can get in a prayer closet and you just feel like you could kick the devil in the teeth and break them all. And other times you feel like he's kicking you in the teeth and breaking all you got. But I'm going to tell you something this morning. If you'll just stay faithful, he'll keep providing another arrow called faith time and time again. And one day, one day, one day, I told my wife the last thing I said to her, walking out the door to come to church this morning, so grieved and troubled in her spirit because she couldn't get up and come to the house of God with me, which is where she wants to be. And the last thing I said to her on the way out the door was one day, it's all going to be a distant memory. What gets me there? What gets me there? You just keep pulling out another arrow. (laughs) Time and time again. Faithfulness always produces faith it's not faith that produces faithfulness y'all it's faithfulness that produces the faith that I need thankful for the faithfulness of God church amen hallelujah
thank you for being in the house of God today. I love you. Father, I pray your blessing over everyone that came to church today. And those that are part of our church unable to be here, just pour out your spirit on them this week, God. Like it's raining outside today, let there be a refreshing in the soul. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I love you.